This is an ABC podcast. Hello, Lisa Leong with you. My guest today is Ken Doan. When I was a kid in the 80s, I loved my Ken Doan Duna cover. A blue, pink and purple flower and sea extravaganza, which seemed to take up my whole tiny bedroom in a good way. I also had the Ken Doan t-shirt and the shorts, as well as his wearable art. Ken is well known for his glorious, colourful, vivid paintings bursting with life from frangipanis and fish to Sunday sunbakers on the scorching beach and harbour views. But long before Ken was a painter, he had a whole other life as an advertising whiz and before that as a country boy in New South Wales who went fishing before school using mullet guts as bait. Ken has stayed in touch with this childlike curiosity and free, fearless self, and it's reverberated throughout his entire life as a painter. Ken Doan, welcome to Conversations. Thank you very much. Ken, paint a picture with words of your part of the world and how you and your wife Judy start each day. Well, look, I'm very, very lucky to live beside Sydney Harbour. I live in a beach called Chinaman's Beach and I've lived there for a very, very long time. So I never take it for granted, but I always wake up quite early, maybe five, and the first thing I have to do is to feed the rainbow lorikeets and the magpies. If I don't feed the magpies, they will come into the kitchen and stand in front of the fridge waiting to be fed. So it's to the sound of the magpies that the day starts. Then when I walk down, I go straight to the studio. My, my big studio is under the house. And I want to see what I've been working on with the freshest possible eyes. And sometimes it's so tempting to stay there and make a few marks. So after being a little time in the studio, I walk down past the frangipanis, past the mandarin trees, past the orange trees, down onto a little building which is called the cabin, which is a building that I first saw when I was about 14 and fell in love with it. The next thing is I have to feed the fish. There are about maybe 40 or 50 brim waiting there and especially at high tide and I feed them with chicken chicken pellets. Then I walk the beach or Judy and I walk the beach and uh, always clean it up a little bit. Uh, Then we come back and we go for a swim every morning, every morning. Every morning? Look, unless it's absolutely torrential rain and even if it's a bit of a sprinkle, we'll still have a swim and then we'll have breakfast. So it is such a beautiful and gentle way of starting the day. I never take it for granted. What was the water like today? It's good. It's a high tide. Tide's coming up today. Uh, Very clean, very kind of pale turquoise water. And some of the rocks are now quite heavily covered with really bright emerald green moss. What did the brim look like? today? The brim? Oh, they're good. Yeah, and they're getting quite big. I never I never fish for them. I don't want to catch any of them. And in fact, if somebody comes along with a fishing rod that looks as though they might be fishing off our front, our front uh, lawn, I throw out a rod with no bait on it to kind of claim that particular area. Do you have a little ritual still with a rock pool? Not too many people know that story. There's a tiny little rock pool, not much bigger than, oh, I don't know, like a, no, not very big, like half a newspaper size. Anyway, I like to find a leaf that is in the shape of a smile and the it's usually bright yellow and I like to place it in that little rock pool as a kind of respect for the day and and also to get to that little rock pool you have to bend your head under the tree in a slightly kind of bowing motion sounds a bit 
in new age this, but <laughs> I like to do every morning. And, um, yeah, it's paying respect to the day. Is it hard to sometimes find a smiling leaf? Well, you can always find some leaves and it depends which way up you put them. <laughs> and I try to find a, a one that's not damaged, that's some kind of uh, yellow shape. But the tree that is above the rock pool, the leaves are kind of lip-sized leaves. And so you've just got to find a smiling one. How far is this idyllic world from where you grew up as a small boy? Well, I grew up in Belmore when there were fields and cows in Belmore. Like, I was born in 1940, right at the start of the war. I lived in a house in Belmore with my mum and my aunts and, and my granddad, my father. I didn't know my father. I didn't see my father till, he, till I was five because he was away in England for five years. And to be in the kind of loving embrace of, uh, of my mother and four young aunts, I'm, I'm sure I was a very spoilt and indulged child. What did the house feel like to you as a child? It was a fairly straightforward house. It had big steps up the front and then a corridor that went straight through into the kitchen. And I think that some of my fondest memories would have been around that kitchen table, especially at Christmas time, when uh, they would hang shiny cellophane in red and green coming from the edges of the wall up to the central light. And it had a lovely little sink that had little like terrazzo, little black and white stones around that sink. I, I can remember being bathed in that sink or maybe <laughs> I can only remember the photographs of me bathed in that sink. But, look, it was a house of love and comfort and, uh, and, 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 and joy. Where was your dad? Well, my father was a bomber pilot and he was in England for five years. So my mother... There was a photograph beside my mother's bed of this person called Dad. I was a bit... I didn't really know what to think of this person because I hadn't met him, but I knew was, his name was Dad. And then on the day that he came home, my mother was always had bad asthma. And on this particular day, she, she was wheezing so much she couldn't even go. And it was at an airport in, uh, in Bankstown. And so... My uh, grandfather and grandmother and one of my aunts and they took me uh, to meet this person called Dad. Well, uh, quite... Do you remember what you were feeling at the time? Oh, I, I, was, I was a bit nervous. I was a bit apprehensive about it. But everybody was so excited and so I'm sure that that makes you feel excited too because you know that something important is happening and then suddenly he was there, this this tall man. Well, like, you know, I was a kid, so everybody <laughs> was tall, uh, with a little suitcase. So I can remember the feeling of the end of the war, a big march down Macquarie Street where my granddad marched and my dad. I can remember the guys in the street playing cricket. I can't remember exactly what... I know, 1945, I can't remember the, what part of the year. It must have been summer because we were outdoors a lot. What had war been like for your father? Well, I guess it was strange for him. It, look, that's a very good question because I love my father and we became very close as we both got older. But I think there was a kind of, not so much a barrier, but there was a, a strange feeling at the start because... He wasn't used to having a son. I wasn't used to having a father. Do you remember if he went straight back to work when he returned? I, c I don't remember that. All I do remember is that not long after he returned, we went up to the north coast and we lived in a little town called McLean on the Clarence River. McLean, it's a lovely town. It's got a big river. You don't have to wear shoes to school. You can go fishing before school. You can go fishing after school. There wasn't any homework. 
if there was, I wouldn't have done it anyway because, you know, I was, I was a kid. I think from the ages of five when I went up there till ten, it's those years that really form you. I used to have to go to Sunday school. Sunday school, you had to wear a little suit to get... And it was always hot, you know? And I wasn't so much enamoured by the kind of concept, but I liked the colouring in. But the minute Sunday school finished, all the kids, we'd jump on our bikes and before you know it, we'd be racing down, racing down to the river to fish. Where did you get the bait? I used to ride my bike down to the down to the uh, fish co-op and we would get mullet guts. Now, mullet guts, especially there's a, a round bit. It looks a bit like an onion. As fact, in kids, we called it the onion. And uh, it was quite easy to put your hook into. And every all the kids, we all had ex-army haversacks because there are a lot of them around in those days. Ex- I can still smell it now, your haversack. It smelled of old prawns. There was always a few sinkers in there and a few hooks that had got caught in the bottom of the canvas bag that no matter how much you tried, you couldn't get them up. And some bits of cheese that your parents might have given you to eat. No one locked the houses. No No one asked where you are. You were out playing or fishing or up the bush and only when it got dark... Did you come home? Was it around this time that you started drawing a lot? Yeah. Look, I'm an only child and drawing is just a natural... was, still is, I suppose, a natural thing for me to do. But the kind of drawings that you did when you were very young are so exciting and without fear. And if you want to draw an arm coming out of the top of someone's head, well, you just draw it. It's only as you get later that you understand the arms come out of the shoulder. So if my mother would ask me, you know, was it a nice party that you went to, it was easier for me to make a drawing to explain. What else were you drawing then? Late in the afternoons there was a program called the Argonauts, right, and they had an art section on it. You could send in drawings. Anyway, I I sent in two drawings, which I still have, and they sent me back two gold stars. Well, I thought, you know, we're on to something here. You know, someone someone likes it. So I I credit the ABC with giving me a very early start, and I I appreciate that. Do you remember which particular paintings got the gold stars? As I remember them, they were fishing boats on the Clarence River and I'd sent in two of them. I don't know why I sent in two. We were quite poor and in our house um, it had like a pressed metal ceiling, had one, had a, you know, corridor that went right, right through. In the kitchen... Because my father had a little truck and used to leave very, very early in the morning. So my mother would get a a big piece of wood, a big log, and you'd put one end of the log into the into the stove, and the other log, the other end would be balanced on a chair. So you know, as it burnt, you pushed the chair in. We didn't have a refrigerator. We had it was a big day when we got our first refrigerator. We had a radio. A radio in those days was about the size of a small refrigerator, right, in a wooden box, but you could sit beside it and it would make you warm because it had valves in it. So that's what I used to do late. I don't know, if maybe it was a Tuesday or something. Listen to the Argonauts leaning against the wooden box, getting warm. Your dad took some local scouts camping. What happened? The local scout group, I was too young to be a scout and they didn't have a kind of junior scout version. Dad would do lots of various carrying jobs and one of them was to take a group of scouts down to Angari, beautiful beach Angari. 
I can remember us all crowding into, like sitting in the back of the truck, you know, no seat belts or any of that kind of stuff, um, going down to Angari to drop off the scout group. And the thing was they were going to fend for themselves for two or three days, like catching fish and eating native foods and stuff like that. So it sounded pretty exciting to me. So we dropped them off with the Scoutmaster and then we drove back home. And it's only about like 20 or 30 miles. By the time we got back home, my mother was standing outside the house waving her arms and shouting something. It turned out that the Scoutmaster had eaten something that obviously didn't agree with him and we had to go back and get him very quickly and bring him back to hospital. So look, I can remember, his whole head, it's like a big purple head. It was so frightening, I didn't even want to look at him. You know, I had to sit in the back of the truck. We went down and we got this guy, brought him back to hospital. I don't know what he'd eaten, but obviously didn't agree with him. (laughs) And we, left the, we left the scouts there and I think in reflection they managed to survive on, you know, Pluto pups and pies and extremely unnatural things for a couple of days until he got back there. Was he okay in the end, Ken? He was okay in the end. That's yeah, good. He learnt his valuable lesson that if you're pull something out of the ground, you better know what it is before you start eating it. Why did your parents then leave town? Well, look, they left town because my grandfather had had a stroke and my father saw it as his responsibility to come down to Springwood and look after his mother and his his father. So we lived in Springwood only for about a couple of years but it was a good experience, or, or some parts of it good, some parts I don't like. The great part was going to school by train. Not just any train. This is a steam train. This is a number 36 engine, billowing smoke and steam coming out of it. As a boy to stand on the station at Springwood, and you could hear it coming up the mountains. You could hear it from Valley Heights, which is the the stop before Springwood. And suddenly this huge engine would come in into the Springwood station and we'd go. It took us about, it's an hour and a half in those days to go up the mountains. I'd wave to my mum and my grandparents as we went past our house in Macquarie Street. And then gradually you wind your way up the mountains to Katoomba. I really didn't like the school very much because it had a concrete playground or asphalt. It was a big brick building. I didn't like that school. What was the business you started with a mate at the time? Michael Baker. I wonder what happened to him. We decided we would start a manure business. So I remember making a poster where I had drawn animals down one side and the price that it would be for a bag of manure from those animals. The target audience was essentially my mum, my aunt and my grandma and maybe the lady next door. So Saturday mornings we would just spend our time in fields and in bushes around Springwood watching animals, basically waiting for them to go to the toilet. We even had a category called wild in case like a a lion escaped from the Warragamba lion farm. Very unlikely, but you could charge a lot for that. But like for old cow, you can't charge much for old cow or old goat. Anyway, we would we would rush out and bag it, sell it to mum or grandma. <laughs> we had a wheelbarrow. That was our mode of transport. And it had ball-bearing wheels. uh, um, It was Michael who... I didn't have ball-bearing wheels, but Michael added the ball-bearing wheels, which ball-bearing wheels is like currency in those days. You had ball-bearing wheels. That's really important stuff. Anyway, we had the ball-bearing wheels on the wheelbarrow and then one day he came around and he said he wanted to have... He wanted to have the billy cart back because he wanted to kind of race it with the ball... And I saw my whole business collapse at that point. And it's a valuable lesson because 
I knew then if you could find a situation where you control the business, that would be better. At your careers appointment at school, you let the vocational trainer know that you wanted to become a barrister. What was their response? I had said that I really like to be a barrister because I, I think I heard, or well, maybe we knew a friend who was a barrister who made lots of money. I thought, oh, I like <laughs> to be a barrister. That'd be good. Anyway, they came back and they said, no, you should be a printer because I guess I was interested in drawings and prints and things. So I don't know. The advertising business is somewhere between a barrister and a printer. So that was a, that was a fair direction. Then you decided to leave school. How did that all happen? I left school. I got an exemption to leave school at 14. You're not supposed to leave till you're 15. But I'd passed the intermediate certificate, which is like year 10, and I I went to Mossman High School where, interestingly enough, they don't... They didn't teach art to boys in Mossman High when I... And nowadays they have very good reputation for teaching art. But in my days, no art for boys. And um, I wanted to go to art school. And so with my dad, we went up to the education department. They're in College Street, I remember that. And uh, I, was allowed to, I was allowed to sit for the examination at East Sydney Tech. And if I was accepted, then, then I could go to art school. Well, I was, you know, I was 14. More than anything else, I wanted to see a totally nude woman. I hadn't seen one up to that point in time. Glimpsed parts, but not a totally nude woman. So I thought, well, that's one of the good reasons for going to art school. Finally, in your second year, did the class you were looking forward to eventuate? Well, well, well finally, yeah, finally in your second year, you do, <laughs> you do get to have live class. Yeah, I look, life class, I remember, started at 9.30. I was there about 20 to 7, you know. And um, you sit around in a circle and a girl comes in and takes off her clothes and you do a series of very brief drawings and then, you know, three-minute pose, five-minute pose, ten-minute pose, and then eventually towards the end of the whole procedure... You have an hour's pose, so you're concentrating. And the art master goes around the outside and leans over to each student and corrects the anatomy. He never came to me. Now, I, was, I was really getting worried. Why wasn't he coming to me? Anyway, he eventually came to me and he leant over and whispered in my ears so the other students, the other kids couldn't hear, and he said, don't you think... It's about time you attempted the head. <laughs> I, I, I left before the course finished because I was, I needed to work. I was out. What was your first commission? Okay, the first commission did happen around about that time. Uh, my uncle, uh, who lived in Hurstville, he had a, a friend who'd been uh, to Finland and this friend of his had seen the Northern Lights and he was very keen to have a painting of the North. Now, I've seen the Northern Lights. I know what they look like now. But in those days, of course, I haven't. So this guy described to me what the feeling he had and what, what he'd like about the painting. So I got a big piece of masonite and I started to make a painting from his description of the Northern Lights. My dad took me over in the old custom line with his big canvas or big bit of board at the back to show it to him. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. He'd, he'd promised me five pounds, a considerable amount of money to do it. Anyway, finally, we got out of the car. We unwrapped it. I showed it to him. He didn't like it. I mean, I, knew, I could sense that he didn't like it, you know, and I was a bit shocked. I think in reflection, <laughs> it might have been the dead gum tree in the <laughs> corner that was a bit of a giveaway. I don't remember any gum trees in Finland <laughs> during that time. But no, he didn't like it. So I've never done a commission since then. Bugger it. It's hard enough for me to work out what's in my head, let alone what's in somebody else's.
podcast, broadcast, and online. You're listening to Conversations. Find out more about the Conversations podcast. Just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. Ken, you mentioned you were desperate to get your first job. What was it? There was a terrific, he's dead now, unfortunately, a terrific art director here called Arthur Holland. He had a studio in Grosvenor Street and at Christmas time he asked for the best student in the college to come and work, like for no money, but to have the work experience of being there. So I spent that uh, summer working with him and it taught me some really good lessons. That was in the fourth year. Halfway through the final year... The guy who ran East Sydney Tech in those days, which now the National Art School was called East Sydney Tech, he came to me and he said, look, there's a terrific job uh, ad, uh, available in a studio called Smith & Julius. Now, Smith & Julius are really old, classic design, commercial art studio. Lloyd Rees worked there at one stage. It's It was when there were lots of magazine illustrations and, you know, before computers and all that kind of stuff. So he said, you should take the job. So I went down there. I took the job. I was thrilled to be there. Anyway, I was only... I was there for two weeks. I was getting £14 a week and a friend of mine offered me an amazing, tempting offer. Number what was one, the offer? twice as much, twenty-eight pounds a week. Number two, I could paint my office whatever colour I wanted. What colour did you choose? Painted it purple. <laughs> Painted it purple. This is nineteen fifty-nine, and so suddenly I was, you know, working as a young art director, and that was the kind of start of that whole uh, career as an art director and as a designer and. Japan and America and London. J. Walter Thompson in London, though, was the absolute leading agency, no question about it. I had terrific accounts. When I first arrived there, like I was an art director, art directors work with copywriters. So they said, well, here's the writer you'll be working with, a rather kind of slightly weedy-looking guy with slightly bug eyes. Anyway, it turned out to be Dylan Thomas's son, Llewellyn. And Lou and I worked closely together for five years in England and I convinced him then to come to Australia, which he did. But we had wonderful times in London. We had wonderful accounts. How did you meet Princess Margaret's husband, Tony Armstrong Jones, the photographer? One of the accounts we had was Campari. Very successful wine or uh, aperitif. And I had worked with uh, Bill Oddie and Tim Brooke Taylor, who went on to become the goodies, and we made a series of 60-second commercials for Campari that went on to win the best commercials in the world, 1969. Now, that's, you know, that's, that's something. Best commercials in the world, that's, you know, that's a... We were, we were thrilled. And so... We decided we wanted to do a series of four-page ads for Campari, just using some of the best photographers that are working in London at that time. But the real coup is if you could get uh, Tony Armstrong Jones, Lord Snowden, because he'd just recently married Princess Margaret. But he was quite distracted. He had an invention that he wanted to show you, Ken. That's absolutely true. What was it? When he decided that he'd, he'd, he'd do the pictures, he asked me to come to his office or to come to, to see him that following Thursday. He lives in Kensington Palace, right? Now, the 800 people live in, work in Thompson's and they all knew I was going to the palace that afternoon and you know, I'm, I'm wearing a suit. I'm going to the toilet every five minutes. 
you get in a taxi outside in Barclay Square and you say uh, Kensington Palace and the guy says, oh, it'll be Kensington Palace Hotel, Gov. He said, no, no, it's the palace itself because you're expected, right? So you eventually, you, the butler, the equerry, and you go into Snowden's office. Yeah, it's quite a small office, lots of pictures of him and Princess Margaret and uh, some nice pictures, nice little Nolan, nice little Nolan painting. Anyway, we're chatting about things and he said to me, had I heard about the moving platform that he'd designed? Unfortunately, I had. Recently, there'd been a thing in the Sunday Times that he designed like a flat platform that you could put whatever chair you were comfortable on and it it had a little motor on it so you you could drive it around. You had some mobility. He said, I'd love you to have a look at it. And I said, well, look, I'm not, I'm not an industrial <laughs> designer, but you can't say no. You can't say no. So he calls the butler and the butler comes in and he takes the chair that he's sitting on, the one behind his desk, and we, we, we put it on the platform. And he said, have a, little, have a little drive around in it. Well, I am not mechanically blessed, you know. It's not one of my good points. Anyway, so I'm zzz, <laughs> driving across the here, zzz, driving through there, and then I zzz, go across to the bookshelf. Door opens in what I thought was the bookshelf, and Princess Margaret walks in. She says, "And who are you?" <laughs> That's right. And you say. Well, I, I, first of all, I do like a half limbo, half curtsy, something to signify some kind of respect, and I say, I am an Australian. Why did that come out? I don't know why it came out. Who knows? You know, you get, you get a bit bamboozled. 1969, you'd married your lovely girlfriend, Judy. You decided to come back to Australia. What do you remember about that hot, summer morning when you flew back here and landed? Well, it was bright. When you fly back into Australia after uh, after being away for such a long time, I think the first thing it did strike you was the, the intensity of the light, the cleanness of the light. Uh, Dad picked us up and we drove back across the Harbour Bridge. You know, the Opera House was almost finished. We were on our way to Mossman for a classic, you know, Sunday baked dinner of roast lamb and peas and mint sauce and all of those smells that you expect to find. Yeah, it was lovely. How were you feeling then, coming home? Oh, we'd been away for five years. We'd we'd come back to Australia a few years previously because in London they said they'd send us around the world if I came back for another uh, two years, which we did. We came back to Australia. We were happy to be back. Uh, we didn't have any children. So if we knew that if we were going to have children or, you know, buy a house, this is where we needed it to be. You started working in advertising again. What happened on your 40th birthday? I did. I, I took over Bryce Courtney's job. He was a you know, good advertising man, a good writer. Um, but I was in Vanuatu. Judy and I were in Vanuatu one, uh, one Sunday and I was talking to the late Peter Brock, very nice guy, Peter, and he was talking about how passionate he was about uh, racing driving, and I realised I was very passionate uh, about painting, not about advertising. So I walked into the chairman's office. Mon- we flew back Sunday. I walked into his office Monday morning and I resigned. I resigned because if you're going to be a painter, it's a journey and you have to give it everything. So between 35 and 40, I did, you know, lots of freelance work. When I was 40, I had my first exhibition on my 40th birthday in, uh, in June 29. Your first exhibition is rather nerve-wracking. I've had more than 100 exhibitions now, but the first one, you know, of course your mum's going to buy a picture and your granny and... Uh, you know, the plumber, 
a guy up in the service station. So you can't take the first exhibition. It's very, very nerve-wracking. You can't take it seriously. You have to move on. Three months later, after that 40th birthday exhibition, you opened your own gallery. Yeah. Why did you decide to open your own gallery? Yeah, look, opening my own gallery, I always saw it as extremely simplistic. I see no reason if a chef can own a restaurant, an artist can own a gallery. I'm not saying everybody can do it, but I've done it now for 40 years. And I think it's a very direct... It means that I can show what I want when I want to do, when I want to show it. I have complete control over that. It's it's been hard, I think, for some members of... I'm not saying the establishment, the art community to accept, but why not? I think in the time in which really things are changing a lot, young musicians putting out their own records, young filmmakers making their own films, you, the structures that exist in the past don't necessarily uh, exist today. When you opened your own gallery, you decided to make a short run of 12 numbered screen-printed T-shirts. What was on them? Yeah, look, in the first exhibition, you're right, there were 12 T-shirts. They were a blue line drawing on white. I had a little studio in North Sydney where I did the freelance work. I I hung them in the tree. <laughs> uh, Who did you give them to, those 12? T-shirts. The first people, one of the first person to buy them, Marion von Adelstein, a great, lovely woman, Marion, uh, used to work for Vogue. Anyway, she wrote a line that said, um, "You can, you can hang it down on the wall, or you can hang it on yourself. There's an integrity to everything he touches." So, from hanging them, and look, we are still selling that particular design. But, yeah, my secretary, who I had for 30 years, she had a little basket beside her desk in Ridge Street and a few tea, and more and more people would come and buy them. And then I realised, look, we need to be somewhere where there's more people. So I saw an ad one Sunday morning for uh, a shop in the Rocks. Anyway, eventually I got that shop. And that's where uh, it was called the Sydney Harbour Shop in those days. And then uh, I had a gallery and a shop on George Street. So I was reaching a wider group of people. And in fact, you're big in Japan. What is it about your work that touches a chord there? Well, Japanese critics have said in articles in Japan that my work shows them what they are not. And back in Australia, people were loving your work here too. How did the art establishment react to your success? A lot of my work in those days should be thought of as design. It's not art. It is a piece of design. Design is when you are trying to solve a specific problem. And when you receive criticism, how do you handle that? Well, it depends where the criticism comes from. A a few years ago, I had a big big exhibition. I've had, let's say, more than 100 exhibitions. I had one in uh, Moorwollambar in the Tweed Regional Galleries. It's a lovely gallery. It's where all Margaret Ollie's stuff is. Anyway, it was good. And there's in big galleries like that, there's always a book where people write their comments. Now, you want to see that. You do? But you want to, oh, yeah, you want to read that. But you can't read it while lots of other people are around. You can't just run over and quickly look at that, you know. So I waited till the time was right. I ran, went, went, went over. I looked at all the comments. 99% of them were great. My mother could have written them. They're fantastic. You know, you couldn't ask for better comments about the reaction to the work. The ones that you remember are the least congratulatory ones and there's a terrific comment there for a girl from a girl who signed herself 10 year old girl from Mwollomba that was her signature and she had written 
really, Ken, I can do better paintings and I'm still in primary school. <laughs> Next time, try harder. <laughs> That's a pretty serious comment. But, of course, she's right. I can't do better paintings than kids in primary school and I'm always trying harder. So criticism depends on where it comes from and whether people know anything about what they're talking about. In the end, it doesn't matter. The relationship between you and the view, you as the viewer and the painting, it's such a personal and private thing. Do you like it? Does it make you feel something good? I like to make paintings that are beautiful, that give people pleasure over time. Like if I w I'm not starting an art school, but if I was starting an art school, the first thing I would say to the students is there are no rules. There are no rules. You can do whatever you like. You can paint in Vegemite if you want. There are no rules. You just have to use it to express what you feel about something, but then it needs somebody else to respond to it. You've often drawn the distinction between the life of a musician and the connection with their audience in real time and your life as a painter, potentially in solitude. Yeah, painters work on their own. Well, I work on my own. I mean, some people might work in groups. I don't. I'm not a collaborative person at all. Um... I make a painting in the dog barks twice because it's just me and the dog in the studio and nowadays we don't even have a dog. So it's a more personal thing. But I envy the musician because to hear them play as a group and then, say in James's case, the tumultuous applause that very rightly comes back uh, swamping him with love and affection. Yeah, that'd be good. What do you love to paint these days? I'm working on a number of pictures that are about the feeling of being under the reef. They're not political paintings, but in the sense if you think that they're beautiful, then you understand how important the barrier reef is and how we should be doing everything to, to protect it. Yeah, so paintings about the beach paintings about uh, the reef, paintings about our garden. I have no problem of thinking about things to paint. Just the, um, the drive changes. I'm better in the morning. I like to paint from 8 till 12, then have lunch, then fall asleep for an hour. I'm old. I'm 82, for goodness sake. Um, then work again late in the afternoon. What would the boy of McLean make of this beautiful life you've made? I would say I've had a very privileged life. I've had a very fortunate life. But look, for instance, here's an example. Last week, or maybe it was the week before, I won an award that said it was the Fashion Laureate Lifetime Achievement Award. The only word that I don't like in there is lifetime. Lifetime. All the other words are fine. <laughs> lifetime <laughs> suggests we are closer to what the we in the trade call dropping off the twig than the start. So I accepted 82. <laughs> I want to be here. I, I'd like to be here till 100. That that would be nice. I've got lots to do. I've got lots of canvases. I've got, I've got things I want to achieve. But I know that the piano could drop out of the sky and hit me on the head, you know, when I leave this interview. Who knows? So what do you make of this life? I'm very fortunate. Family, health... That's all you need. Maybe the other way around. Health, family and the desire to work. I like to, I like to work. Thank you so much, Ken. It's a great pleasure. My guest on Conversations today is Ken Doan. Check out our program page at abc.net.au and our Facebook page for links to many more conversations with wonderful guests. I'm Lisa Leong. 
Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.